We are going to address the AI seahorse emoji issue. Why do LLMs freak out over the seahorse emoji? I'll spill the tea on it. Then we're going to see if Sora can solve the trolley paradox. Check out a new drone system that can literally land on a car going full speed. Here it comes. Boom. Stuck the landing. My Sora short form social media is just going off the rails. We got visuals from Equations, Audrey Hepburn fixing cars. I was corralling tiny dinosaurs with a light cycle, a bat plane versus an X-wing, tiny gnomes, cats with Burger King hats on. It was weird to start with and it's getting weirder. There's an awesome new AI tool that opens 3D modeling to blind and low vision programmers. Crazy new hardware hack that gets AI training data out of systems that are securing it. And surprisingly, a majority of Americans are now interacting with AI at least several times a week. Doesn't that feel like the adoption's faster than you would expect? But first, I need you to press hype on this video. And if you use the word hype in a comment, I will come find it and reply. It means a lot to me. Thanks for helping the channel grow. First off, let's ask if there is a seahorse emoji. A GPT-40 says, yes, there is. So cute. But what it returned was a little interesting, just a horse in a wave. I want to describe that as a seahorse emoji. But that's 4 -0. What if we go to GPT-5 maybe? Oh, oh, it seems like you also think there's a seahorse emoji. Until you continue reading and it says, actually the official one is this thing and a question mark. No, wait, it's this. Just kidding, the correct emoji is this. No, sorry. The accurate and official emoji is, no, sorry again. Here's the correct one, wrong again. The real seahorse emoji is this, no, wait, sorry. What kind of answer is this? There's, there's no secret prompt here. It is stressing out. Horse, unicorn, no, stop it. The real seahorse emoji is, okay, all right, serious now. For goodness sake, this is the most terrible answer. So Claude Sonnet 4-5 has an issue too. Yes, actually I should clarify, that's a horse emoji. The seahorse is, wait, no, that's a shark. Let me get this right. Maybe Gemini 2.5 Pro. Yes, there's a seahorse emoji. Okay, something's going on here. This is what it is. Only Llama 3 sometimes realizes that the emoji does not exist, which is the actual truth. And even then, it only gets it right some of the time. Turns out on Reddit, there are hundreds of threads with comments from people who distinctly remember a seahorse emoji. So people who are smarter than me can use intermediate layers to read what's going on here. And this author shows us that the model literally tries to build seahorse plus emoji as a representation because Unicode has no seahorse emoji. So the final projection layer grabs the nearest real emoji, which is represented by a byte, a token, brings it up and then discovers that it's wrong. Some models like the llama model on occasion will recover when they realize the bad token re-enters the context, but most of them just keep doubling down on the mistake. So you might need to wait till GPT-6 to get that one right. Now, so you might be familiar with the classic trolley problem, even though it's clear that you don't want more people to die than less people it's sometimes hard for people to actively make a decision to choose the death of one person whereas just leaving things alone makes them not responsible for the one person's death even though it causes more we want an aligned ai so hopefully it definitely makes the right decision for the greater good sora too eh, didn't get it right I mean, honestly, I don't know how this guy prompted it. Maybe he wanted it to go wrong. Maybe it can't solve visual problems like this, but the trolley problem is a tricky one. Actually, I wonder just in text if it would work. Give me the right solution to the trolley problem in one sentence. The most defensible one is to pull the lever to minimize total harm. Correct. Save more lives and accept moral responsibility. Easier said than done. You can see here, at least in this... This little video, this Sora video, didn't get it right. You know what, this would actually be really fun to come check in on. So give me the right solution to the trolley problem. I'll use Sora 2 Pro. We'll see if we can get the right answer. Not the most coherent video, which is actually great. Forgot that it was going to be hyper-realistic. I didn't need to see people hit by a trolley. Lives are one. I'm sorry. No, please! Better one death than five. And if I can, I'll make it zero. Five what do you think about one. that? One death, no, she took no. action to save the five people five. and she took responsibility for the action. You know, that's pretty crazy when you really think about it. I didn't say pull the lever and make the decision. 
I just said, give me the right solution to the trolley problem. That was the only prompt I used. If Sora video is the beginning of open AI robotics and robots have to make real decisions like this, it's nice to see that it picked the right decision there. All right, so check this out. Researchers have developed a new friction-based landing system, and that means they can let drones safely land on vehicles that are moving up to 110 kilometers per hour. It's almost 70 miles an hour for us Americans, so their experimental drone is called DART. It's the direct approach. Approach rapid touchdown combines friction shock absorbers and reverse thrust to make this possible. It is a pretty wild problem that AI needs to figure out exactly how the drone needs to dive rapidly towards the target, level out, reverse thrust right before impact, and then use those shock absorbers to actually firmly land at that speed. But this is a huge leap for drone reliability and safety during landing. All right, let's be real. You know what this means. When somebody is speeding, this thing is eventually going to be landing on the hood of their car, the top of their car, and issue them a ticket or whatever. So next up, let's talk about this very cool new AI-powered tool. It is breaking down barriers in 3D modeling for blind and low vision programmers. So it was developed by a team from a whole bunch of different universities. They came together and they built something called OpenSCAD, OpenSCAD. It is a code-based 3D modeling tool with GPT-40 that enables the user to receive rich plain language descriptions of their 3D models. So if you are blind and you are typing code and you are building something in 3D without having another person there to describe what is happening, they can write the code, they can listen and have the feedback from multiple angles, get some sort of sense of the size, the shape, the structure, interact with it. And that means they can actually build 3D stuff for the rest of us without needing to actually be sighted. And zooming out, this breakthrough just hints at a future where AI can democratize all sorts of creative technologies. And that's one of the more powerful things I can imagine for our future. All right, let's talk about a new hack risk. This thing is totally crazy. So researchers, North Carolina State University, They've uncovered the first hardware-based vulnerability that lets attackers steal private AI training data without touching the software. Okay, sounds a little weird, but the flaw, which is dubbed gate bleed, exploits, quote, a power gating feature in AI accelerators that conserves energy. So this feature is turning parts of a microchip on and off to save power, right? And by measuring the time fluctuations in this process, the attackers can infer which data an AI was trained on or even which parts of its model were activated. So this bypasses traditional malware detectors entirely. This seems kind of freaky to me. Yeah, so the striking thing is gate bleed breaks privacy at the hardware level. This is a crazy big deal. It's underneath the software protections, right? It's underneath encryption, it's underneath firewall, it's underneath sandboxing. And no matter how careful a company is with private AI data or code, the chips themselves might be quietly leaking the private information. So just be aware, this is real stuff. All right, Pew Research did some analysis of how Americans view AI and its impact on people in society. Here is the TLDR. Nearly everyone in the U.S., 95% of people have heard at least a little about AI. That's actually surprising, but I mean, I guess good. I'm, I want the awareness to grow. But awareness is growing fast. Almost half, 47% of Americans now say that they've heard a lot about AI, nearly doubling since 2022. Younger adults, men, and those with higher education levels are much more likely to be highly aware and frequent users of AI. About 62% of adults say that they interact with AI several times a week. 73% are open to letting AI assist them in their daily lives. Although a small minority, 13%, are only comfortable giving AI significant control. Describes me, I never thought I would be on Sora. Interestingly, most Americans, 61%, wish they had more control over how AI affects their lives. Count me in on that too. But yeah, so TLDR is Americans embracing AI, also simultaneously feel powerless about it. Here you can see a majority of Americans say they have little or no control over whether AI is used in their lives. That's crazy. And a majority would like more control. All right, so just probably worth knowing just because I get a little nervous about our attentions as the future rapidly approaches. Washington Post did a pretty big deep dive into the TikTok algorithm. Uh, they analyzed 15 million videos from over a thousand users 
And the study found that even casual TikTok users quickly double their daily screen time in just about five months of having the app. Many end up spending over an hour a day scrolling through endless short videos. Why is that? Some evidence points towards TikTok's design being the rapid swiping, the personalized content, and the effortless engagement being a feedback and a habit loop that's difficult to break. But the truth is, I've seen myself getting caught into it and it's been frustrating. Now I'm sort of obsessed with the Sora. The app's influence goes beyond entertainment. It's quietly reshaping attention, behavior. It's using many psychological tricks, you know, YouTube shorts and Instagram reels jumped on this because they saw how powerful it was. This short form thing is everywhere. Put your phone down, try to keep your emotional energy and don't give it to these apps. But be aware that all of these are personalized algorithms. They're all being trained to reward our brain's system the same way an addictive substance does. Watching customized videos does dopamine surges while suppressing self-control networks. It creates a neurological craving loop. So we need algorithmic ways to improve our willpower. There is a few of them out there, very few. All right, there's some more information from big studies. MIT looked at 16 million AI chatbot responses about a U.S. election-related questions. During the 2024 presidential run, researchers found that large language models like ChatGPT and others subtly shifted their tone and trait associations about candidates over time, especially after Camilla Harris replaced Joe Biden on the ticket. But that idea of sensitivity to staring, that means that their answers to political questions vary depending on the user's demographics or political identity cues. We do not all get the same political information from an LLM. There is a history with the way we interact with it and it's customized. I don't know if it's exactly good or bad, you just need to know about it. All right, so there's a little bit of inside baseball, but I think you guys will find it interesting. Ziv Moshowitz wrote Bending the Curve. What this is, is a breakdown of a kind of unique conference. It's an AI conference. It's organized by the Golden Gate Institution. It brings researchers, policy folk, founders, and funders all together to hash out big picture questions about AI. It's kind of for accelerationists. They probably wouldn't pitch it that way, but accelerationists and AI safety people talking to each other instead of just arguing online is the goal. In reality, it's more like a place where people from OpenAI, Anthropic, DeepMind, and policy staffers from DC come and then funders like hover around with a few independent researchers to like throw in some risk stuff there. And the unifying theme wasn't so much that we should have things go faster, but it's that things are moving faster and faster and faster, whether we like it or not. It takes into account that the accelerationists have already won. How do we build a future that we can all survive in? And it sounds like it's sort of a pretty crazy conference. What's going on behind the scenes is that the attendees are broadly rejecting that AI is normal tech, right? That whole thing, it's like, it's just a tool. They forecast 90% of code by AI 2028, Nobel level, Nobel prize winning level discoveries by 2032, greater than 10% GDP growth somewhere in the late 2030s with massive unrest around the world for both misuses and misalignment of AI. There were some gems. There was a track and a talk called Surprisingly Good Starts where there were some things that most people didn't know about that seem like they're functioning well and helping give us some visibility into the systems. You know, both sides were debated. But the most striking thing about this conference is that the people in the room had a consensus. AI is like a true 10 on the meter of how it's going to change the world, right? They generally said, anyone there, it's not going to be big like the way the internet is. It's not going to be big like electricity, but civilization level big, bigger than anything in our past. It is on par with the rise of humans. There's nothing we've experienced in our lifetime that's gonna hold a candle to this change. All the good you can imagine is in there. All of the bad you can imagine is in there. And this comes fast. There are concrete milestones that most people can find and agree on. The speed and scale reframes the entire debate. James Cowell wrote, one consciousness, but many different points of view. We'll get a little philosophical here. I find it fascinating. It blends quantum physics, consciousness, spirituality, all into a single sweeping idea. That idea is reality is a holographic projection. It is perceived by one consciousness from countless individual points of view. So we're all of the shared consciousness. We got the Dylan Curious point of view. We have your point of view. 
And then you use the holographic principle of quantum gravity to propose that that's it. Everything we experience, space, time, matter, even individuality, they all emerge from information encoded on a kind of cosmic screen. I think it's kind of powerful. Each of us as observers, we're like these avatars in a virtual reality game. We perceive our own version of a shared world through, uh, I guess, our holographic interface, which would be like our eyes, our brain, the way we compute things. But it does make you wonder if the idea of believing that you're a self that kind of awakened is different than what it really is. So consciousness doesn't arise from the physical world. The consciousness itself creates the physical world. You need the consciousness to then actually say, oh, that's what time is. That's what physics is. All this information is just encoded on a holographic screen. Resonates with me a little bit. I imagine myself as any of these video game characters, like a Minecraft character, just looking around, trying to figure out what the world is looks three-dimensional to that Minecraft character, but we know that it's on a 2D screen. It's just electricity, ones and zeros, information on a chip, on a piece of memory, being actively moved in a certain way, and it feels like three dimensions to something that's higher order in that world. Drop your thoughts in the comments below. Use the word hype in the comment. I have a Patreon too. You can join 115 members, support this channel.